Hi, everyone. We'll just give a couple moments here for people to get logged in and get comfortable. And then we'll get started. Okay, welcome. Um, we'll just, whenever you join in is fine because this is being recorded and will be published um, later by the EDI committee and the wellbeing committee on our SharePoint site as usual. So um, most of you have attended a webinar with me before. I am Danny Dutro. I'm one of the psychotherapists here at Valley and also function as your employee behavioral health advocate. And today I am so excited to be joined by Sarah Davis and I'm going to have her introduce herself and talk a little bit about the theme and purpose of our webinar today as we think about uh, BIPOC Mental Health Awareness Month. So Sarah, I will hand it off to you. Thank you so much, Danny. It's such a pleasure to be here. And yeah, this topic, um, sorry, my name is Sarah Davis and I am the clinic supervisor at Kent Primary Care. And I have been with Valley for um, eight years in November. So coming up on that anniversary and worked as a community health facilitator as well. So um, just have a really deep passion for community health and well-being. And so I'm excited to have this opportunity to, to speak with Danny and, and share this information with you all. Um, we're here to talk about BIPOC mental health. So um, black, indigenous, and people of color and the impacts that um, mental health has on this community and the inequities that exist within this, um, this health discipline and access to care and just how it really impacts the life outcomes and well-being of of that of these communities. Yeah, thanks Sarah and I'm I'm glad you um extrapolated on the acronym, the BIPOC acronym, because I do think it's really important um, and, and research has borne this out that we used first person and person centered language whenever possible. And the BIPOC acronym really does that attempting to highlight the difference in each group's lived experience rather than lumping them all together with an umbrella word like minority, which won't actually be accurate or applicable um, shortly here anyway. So uh, we do this in mental health care already by speaking about people as being somebody who um, has bipolar disorder, for example, rather than describing them as being bipolar. Um, so, so having this more person-centered, more, more accurate use of language is, is one way that we can help people with it, overcoming some of these barriers to care. Um, some of those within the BIPOC experience are uh, cultural stigma within the, the Black, Indigenous, people of color communities, um, systemic racism, and uh, I do want to talk about a couple of numbers before we move beyond the numbers because I think that they're really important for us to understand as we frame this conversation. Black Americans are 20% more likely to experience mental health problems, but only one third of Black adults who need mental health care actually receive it. And that is due to many of these barriers and stigmas. Um, there are also language barriers. Uh, BIPOC people are more likely to speak a language other than English at home. There is lack of access, which is true across the board, but in particular for this community. Mistrust of mental health providers. And, and lack of cultural competency among those providers. Um, we don't often reflect the community that we serve since only 2% of the American Psychological Association members are black and 86% of psychologists are white. 
um, providers who aren't part of the, that community might underestimate the effects of racism and discrimination and and might be you know more likely to dismiss or not see the way that people are suffering um so so sarah i'd really like to hear from you what you see in your practice and what you see as some of these barriers and how we we might be able to begin to overcome them and, and further this conversation yeah, so much of my training, um, I have a master's in maternal child health systems and my, my undergrad was in human development and family sciences. So most of my education and work revolves around the familial unit and community support, specifically through pregnancy and, and early childhood. So um, a lot of what I've researched and learned about has to do with adverse childhood um, experiences, which is really the framework of how um, our future generations are brought up and the traumas that they experience um, really shapes the way that they think. And research shows that brain development is highly impacted by these experiences as well and can lead to poor health and lifestyle outcomes. And so when we really think about um, you know, impacting the future generations, we can start at birth and, and making sure that the parent and child relationship and family relationship um, is strong and the community is strong. Um, according to the Center of Child, Counsel of child Counseling, um, in the United States, 61% of Black children and 51% of Hispanic children have experienced at least one adverse child experience. And that's compared to 40% of white children. So there is an inequity. Of course, we would like all of those numbers to be brought down, but just seeing that it is possible that the community and the, the environment that our BIPOC community is raised in predisposes them to these poor outcomes and then therefore increases um, mental health issues along down the road. Um, the, the lowest rate is in the Asian community. So it, it would be interesting to do more research on how that community has, has addressed these situations. Um, and the highest population at risk is, is the black community. And really from my experience, it has to do with, like you said, Danny's stigma of addressing mental health and thinking that that is a weakness. Um, and unfortunately that really impacts a whole community's well-being. Um, and then in healthcare, it has been stated that certain demographics are predisposed for, um, you know, health issues such as like high blood pressure or diabetes, but it with epigenetics and like we had kind of talked on generational trauma, it's possible that these are really just influenced by the environment that these communities are in and, um, when we um, look at that, the relationship really is strong. So while generational trauma is a, a relatively new topic and, and focus, um, we already know that social determinants of health have a strong connection between health outcomes. Um, and we've known this for a long time. So the study of epigenetics and generational trauma provides a link to the long-term effects of social determinants of health within a, a community and within a family. So it's really important to focus on like awareness of awareness of our interactions with our community and with our um, how like I'm a parent I have two children so I catch myself saying things that I knew my parents I did not like my parents to say to me or how to treat me and so um, I'm learning and evolving and so I try to catch myself and improve those those interactions so that I'm healing um, that generational communication and trauma. And each person, I truly believe, can positively impact the health of our future and our, our generations. So opening the door for vulnerability within your family and community it doesn't show weakness, it actually shows strength. So um, you're, you're teaching your children or your people around you that, that it's okay to be vulnerable, it's okay to ask for help. Uh, we're all human and humans have imperfections, um, but when we reach out, we can reach out for help. 
and rely on our community to uplift us in times of need. And then in return, um, we may be able to offer that strength to someone else when they're in a time of need as well. So just offering that um, olive branch, it, it really is important. Um, so there's lots of resources uh, within our community. And while it's not really highly publicized because of the unfortunate taboo and stigma that revolves around mental health, um, I'm hoping with Danny's help that this conversation really does spark that conversation within um, our community at Valley and within the, the South King County area and, and beyond. Yeah, I really appreciate what you're saying about the community really being a place where we can go to resource, but also a place to concentrate our efforts as hopefully advocates and people who are trying to move this conversation forward. I was lucky enough to be trained in a graduate program that focused on the idea of community counseling and that you can have a great therapeutic interaction. You and I can help our patients every day, but if they're continuously going home home to a place where they're having these adverse child experience, childhood experiences, where they are discriminated against, where their community is unhealthy in, a, in, in any number of ways, it's really hard for them to achieve healing and to, and to heal from these, these traumas or, or just everyday stressors. So I appreciate the, the focus on community. And I do think that as a community here at Valley, that's why these conversations are so important. And I so appreciate uh, your work and, and EDI's work in this area and in getting the resources here um, because it, it does, it impacts all of our well being. All of us have a community that we exist in and um, trying to heal that community and, and make it a safe place where we can be vulnerable ask for help and um, seek the resources that we need. And um, I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit more about um, the idea of generational trauma, because it is such kind of a kind of a new to us term. And it's it's one that that I've been very fascinated by and have been doing some reading about, but I feel privileged to have you in my presence today to um, to give us and our audience an idea of, of what that what that idea is, what what that means. Yeah, so again, it's it's relatively new. It's still being researched. Tons of research needs to happen with it, I believe. Um, but with generational uh, trauma, it's believed that truly DNA is altered. So um, it's kind of like fight, um, fight or flight. And if when you're in these prolonged times of stress or um, abuse, your DNA, certain it's believed that certain DNA um, is activated. And then in that, when you have um, offspring, that offspring is then already predisposed because the, that DNA is activated. And so when it's not healed, when it's not addressed, that's where we see it continue throughout the, the generations to come. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. And we had we had discussed in preparation for this a little bit about sort of what you can expect from me in my office or if you do reach out because we're, you know, we're looking specifically at, at mental health here and mental health awareness for the BIPOC community. And so um, you had asked me a very good question about when working with a person of color, how do you lay the foundation to ensure they are able to feel safe? And, you know, I, in my practice, do that by, um, I really take a, a humanist perspective, which means that I believe that we each carry the answers to our own life and that each individual um, experience, each person's, uh, yeah, experience, community, psychology is different. And it's not for me to make assumptions. It's for me to ask questions and be curious and maintain that, that listening position where I can really hear people. So in, in, I try to help, to help people 
recognize that in me, right? So I, I also believe very much in an interpersonal sort of interaction that we heal in relation to others as, as we've been talking about today. And so um, I encourage everyone when they are seeking healthcare in general, but mental health care in particular, when you're, when you're seeing your therapist, you know, it, it is okay to ask them this question ask them about the experience that they have working with people in your community, people of color, um, or, or with people who maybe have similar diagnoses or, or lived experiences to you. I think that that is a, is a excellent question to help lay the foundation for your relationship with your therapist, because it is one that is very important and is based on trust. And so being able to ask and have those questions answered. And if you don't receive a satisfactory answer, that is more than a good enough reason to, to seek a different provider. Um, and so just give empowering you, I hope to be able to, to ask those questions and, 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 and make sure that you, you enter into that, that relationship um, with, you know, everybody understanding the expectations and, and sort of the, the ground rules there. Um. Yeah, I appreciate you talking about advocating for yourself. I think that sometimes it's believed that um, every healthcare provider is the same and that it's supposed to be a one size fits all, but um, it's okay to do a little bit of searching to find who really you connect well with. Um, and like you said, Danny, making sure that um, you feel safe. And so I really appreciate you laying that foundation because um, as a person of, um, of, of color, I, I've had trouble finding somebody who really matches myself. And I know that I'm not the only one. And so to have somebody who is available that understands and has knowledge about that um, really supports really supports our community as well. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's it's something I've worked really hard on in my own practice because, you know, like I said, I really believe that we heal through this relationship. And so it's very important to me to have that. And and as Debbie said in the comments, providers work for you and you should always feel comfortable with who you're seeing. And I echo that completely. And, and I think Sarah does too, where it's just yes, we, we do work for you, you know, and, and you do want to ask and have those questions answered. I also, one of the reasons I have um, spent a lot of time and, and effort working on this is that with my specialty in trauma and stressor related disorders, I have worked with a lot of veterans and um, first responders over the years, and I am not a veteran myself. So it was very important to me to learn how to work with and understand a community that that I'm not a part of, but to use my expertise to assist them in their healing journey. And so that's what I also hope to do with my, with my, my patients, my clients of color, with anyone who has a different lived experience than me, learning about them, learning about their perspective. And like I said, coming at it from this place of curiosity and listening. And yes, I work for you. Exactly. Yeah, I also um, wanted to just voice that we have within EDI, we've been doing the affinity groups. And so I want to just make sure that everyone is aware that that is also an opportunity to do more of like a community and group. Um, I've, it's been called a therapy session many times. I lead the Black affinity group here. Um, and so people come and they say, this is like a, a therapy session for me. And I, I really am grateful for that because I want people to come and be able to be vulnerable, to be able to be open and um, learn from each other. I think that sometimes even within our community, we have different experiences and it is, it is good to be there to learn from one another and to support each other through ups and downs. Um, and then we're not always talking about like the hardships. I like to um, focus on the empowerment and the joy that 
exists within each community. So um, this month we, we did discuss um, what is Black joy and traditions and um, whether it be family or community based, uh, just what really brings that excitement and, and happy feeling. And so rather than always, you know, focusing on the, the hardships, because life is hard for many, if not all, we all encounter hardships. Um, it's, it's really important for me to focus on the, the happiness as well. And so I, I hope that more will be able to join and continue to, to lean on each other in that group. Yeah, that's a great, thank you for pointing that out. Um, and, and you all keep an eye out for, so the, so the VMC Black Affinity Group is monthly the second Monday of the month, right? Okay, and then keep an eye out for the communications from the EDI committee, because there are other affinity groups and accountability groups. And I really encourage you to seek that kind of support like Sarah was saying, because they call them support groups for a reason. When we get together with people who have similar experiences, who have been there before us, who, who maybe you know have found ways through, um, it can be really uplifting. And it does. It's not just about you know always cathartic and complaining. And and but there's a place for that too. Don't get me wrong. But 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 I appreciate the 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 focus on you know, getting through and, and healing and finding, finding paths to feeling better. Um, and uh, I know you had some other resources too, Sarah, that you wanted, that I wanted to be sure that we mentioned today before we run out of time. Yeah. So um, the EDI newsletter came out this week and did include um, some of the resources. There's um, local and national resources. So if you have people in this area or you know across the United States you can always um, share these with them um, as well as books for your own learning um, is all provided on there so um, one of the um, local all of the ones that I'm going to list are local I believe and so we have the National Alliance on Mental Health um, Illness or Mental Illness and that's NAMI um, so they are local based. Um, they have great resources on their website. They offer like counseling and, and all different ranges of mental health support. Um, there's also the Washington Counselors of Color Network. And so you can go on this website and try to find somebody who fits your community. Uh, it's also called the multi Multicultural Counselors. And so you can really narrow in on, on what community and what provider fits best for you. Um, and then uh, we have Mother Nation. It's for specifically for um, na Indigenous people, um, Native women and their families. And um, oftentimes that is a group that has some more difficulty finding some support. So hopeful that if anyone needs that, that's available. Um, we also have community passageways and their catchphrase is literally community is the answer. And um, I really resonate with that. Our mission statement here is caring for community like family and um, whoever your familial unit is, whether it's um, choose, chosen or by blood. I just think that community passageways offers a lot of resources and um, support groups are available through them as well. Um, one day or one group that I, I really am grateful for is the therapy for black men. And honestly, um, I think that as we've talked about the stigma of mental health awareness and asking for help for black men is, is very high and unfortunately um, is traumatic. And so this resource, really offers a lot of support specific um, with a lot of knowledge for this for this population. Um, but there's many. So um, Google them, look up the EDI newsletter, um, just go through your resources. Um, I also am a, an, a book reader. I read a lot. So um, with rather than if you can't afford buying the books, uh, I recommend getting a library card <laughs> and I have like the Libby app on my phone and you can just get audiobooks or um, or re read um, ebooks 
and that way you can do your own Kristen, Kristen yet yeah, love Libby <laughs> me too but you can do your own reading on these topics and whether you're wanting to learn about other communities or your own community um, there's lots to lots to be read and, and learned out there yeah for sure thank you so much for those and I do want to announce to everybody that um Sarah will be joining us for the Q&A session that we usually hold at the end of the month. So this month it's on Wednesday, the 27th at 1130. So if you have follow up questions and you want to send them in advance, you can send them to the Wellbeing Committee, wellbeing at valleymed.org or join us live and put it in the Q&A. Sarah and I will both be there to answer you. Um, if you missed any of these resources, uh, the EDI committee will, will be putting out communication with this recording and the resources that we mentioned, some of the tips and notes from this session. So look for that in your inboxes soon. And remember that you can reach me to request, request a consultation by emailing wellbeing or contacting my intake coordinator over at Psychiatry and Counseling Clinic. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. I think this was a really valuable conversation. I appreciate your time today, and I'm so happy that we get to do the Q&A together at the end of the month. Um, and uh, yeah, great. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you as well, Danny. This has been great. <laughs> Excellent. Have a lovely well-being hour. If you don't get to take it right now, I hope you take one this week um, and we will see you at the end of the month. Thank you, everybody.